VO in Stereo is sponsored by Bodalgo, international voice acting platform. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back to VO and Stereo. As always, I'm your host, Jared Breshers, with me and by my side as usual, and always and forever, Stephen Coghill. Hello. Today's going to be awesome. Today's going to be really awesome. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, and all that fun stuff. But uh, do you watch TV? Then you've seen them. Um, oh, you don't watch TV? Do you watch films? Well, then you've fucking seen them. <laughs> Please help me welcome Nestor Serrano. Woo! Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. You guys sit down. Sit down. You're making you're making me embarrassed. Of course. At ease. At ease, gentlemen. At ease. What happened? Oh my God. I'm sorry. Are you I'm okay? Sorry. I am. <laughs> the whole brick wall I'm moved. Seventh everything. trimester. I gotta calm that shit down. <laughs> you know what? When you when you get to be my age and and you got to do something, even if it's comedy, and you got to get down on the floor like you just did, the first thing we ask, and we, I mean, you know, the elders. What else can I do while I'm down here? <laughs> you know, How many is there fix this chair. Picked up? There's the TV remote that I didn't care about because I had to go under the couch to get it. The hell with that. It was dead to me at that point. <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah. get that. Mm. Well, welcome to the show. Thanks for ta uh, taking out time to be with us today. Appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Um, my first question to you is, my first question to everybody is, where are you from? What's a good place to start? Okay. Uh, I'm from uh, the Bronx in New York. And uh, it, by the way, just a, a little FYI, what, 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 you, there, there is no such thing as the Manhattan or the Queens or the Staten Island. There's only the Bronx. Does anybody know why? No. Okay. We certainly don't. There's certainly <laughs> so the, somebody who does. Personal the ownership? <laughs> What's that? Personal ownership? Like, no. No, okay. <laughs> no, because the Bronx used to be owned by a Dutch farmer whose name was Bronk, B-R-O-N-C. And so, you know, when I go to my friend's house, I'll go to the Mendelssohn's, I'll go to the Jim's, I'll go to the Jameson's, I'll go to the Tito's, I'll go to the, you know, right? Those are all alcohols, by the way. Right. I told uh, but, you know, <laughs> when you go to somebody's house, you call it the right and uh so everybody used to go to the whenever anybody went to the farm they went to the bronx and so uh somewhere in the late 1800s or early 1900s uh the city took annexed the bronx and just changed the name legally and put an x where the c used to be so look at that right aren't we smarter already our, our first tidbit See, of information the iq of my whole audience went up four points right there this is the best show <laughs> ever <laughs> okay so anyway so i was born in bronx hospital okay. in the bronx and um lived in the south bronx for the first uh eight years of my life went to catholic school and i have the scars to prove it <laughs> and then i moved up to the north bronx and in the north bronx it was a whole different, I mean, you know, I went from a primarily a Puerto Rican black neighborhood to an entirely Irish neighborhood. And there was a tree a block and a half away. And I remember seeing that tree for the first time on a city block. I thought we had moved to the country. <laughs> it was so, like, it just blew me away. What's what, that green thing, tree? daddy? <laughs> oh, oh, that's shit. where they hide their gold out behind the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that was uh, that was an interesting uh expansion of my horizons at that time and then um uh i went to i left catholic school and uh i refused to go i told my mother if you send me catholic school up here i'm running away from home <laughs> so i went to public school where i learned how to you know like break into people's houses and stuff like that um and you know uh, things in life 
<laughs> the important thing. School no, I actually never did that. I did, I did stuff a lot worse than that, but I never actually broke into anybody's house. Um, but the, you know, there was, it was uh, thuggery and and mischief and all kinds of stuff. So uh, that was that. And then I graduated. No, I didn't graduate. I <laughs> dropped out of school at the age of close to graduating. I like how you you I want to tell the story. And you're like, wait a minute, that didn't happen. I didn't graduate. Now I graduated. <laughs> right. <laughs> I had graduated Princeton with honors. And no, wait. Was fantastic. I trashed that school when I was drunk once. Oh, no, no. We kept that shit on fire and we put it down yeah. First Avenue. It was freaking awesome. So I, uh, I graduated uh, again. I did not graduate. The reason that I'm confused about that is yes. because I dropped out of school in the 10th grade. I was 16 years old. I realized my, the error of my ways when I was 17 years old. Got my GED when I was in my late 17. So I actually graduated with a GED before my then former, you know, fellow students graduated from high school. And I went to D. Wick Clinton. And if you know anything about D. Wick Clinton, you understand why I dropped out of school. I went to uh, three, six, I went to six years of all boys school. And it was, it was just a, it was a nightmare. It was a prep school for like, you know, uh, prison. Wow. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't enjoy going to school. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I wanted to get a car and I wanted to get girls. And so I, I went and did that. And then, I, like I said, I realized, got my GED and then uh, started working at a bank in upstate New York. First car. Oh, Toyota Celica, 1973. Wow. Nice. My first car was a Toyota Celica, 1976. What? Oh. 1987 Datsun SX. Looks like the Inspector Gadget mobile with the grill on it back. <laughs> I drove that stuff until the wheels fell off. Yours, <laughs> yours was a five-speed, right? Oh, yeah. Five-speed. With the longest, Nestor. why the hell was the stick way up here? <laughs> I don't know why the hell the stick was so long from the gear shit. That was some nonsense. But, but uh, so so I, I learned how to drive a, a stick with my friend's Dodge charger Ooh. and uh it goes in one direction and it's got a big long you know going for, I, I don't speak gear talk but you know the, <laughs> the, the expansion from one to the other is pretty expansive That's to go from on one to three, two to three yeah, sir. Uh, yeah. inline six and whatnot how the proper copper writers yeah <laughs> you got it you took the words right out of my mouth and so i uh i go to buy the car Again, I'm 17 years old now, and I get into this car, and they give me the keys, and I drive out of the showroom, and I was doing okay uh, until about a quarter of a block away, there was a hill. And I could not get that baby started. I mean, it, it just kept stalling on me and stalling on me and stalling. I had the, the hazards on, people yelling at me, they're screaming at me, that, and uh, I had to get a friend to come and help me get my own car back home so this was uh was it your first time driving stick is that what was going on it was my first time driving that kind of stick i see so I, I was only used to the dodge charger which was actually in reverse it would be one two three four and this one is you know the other way around and uh so it was pretty embarrassing but once you get the hang of it you know then you get the hang of it that's true yeah so that was in 1973 get a load of this 1973 I bought this tiny little car when all my boys had big, huge, you know, the Chargers and the and the uh, the uh, the Super Sports, the Chevys, and I had this little thing which at the time was considered to be a clown car, <laughs> but I loved it. It was sexy. In '73, that car was sexy. Anyway, uh, 1974. So I paid twenty eight hundred dollars, brand new, right out of the showroom, twenty eight hundred bucks. I went back. A year later, because I wanted to get a new model, but of course that was after the oil embargo, and it was now that same car one year later worth uh, cost over four thousand dollars. So you know that's a twelve hundred dollar jump in just one year for the same exact car. Now that a, took you know, uh, that took leaded gas, right? That took uh, yeah. Not quite as bad as the uh, the Electra two twenty five. No, but it yeah. took it took leaded gas. And at that it time, did. it was like super cheap. So you could fill the tank up like yep. nothing, $5. Right. You know? 
Well, I, I remember right around the, before the oil embargo, it was literally like something like 60 cents a gallon. Yeah. And then after the oil embargo, it was it was broaching uh, a dollar a gallon, which was like scandalous at the time. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I, I stuck with that car until I ran into a, uh, a wall. <laughs> and then... You ran into the wall, or the wall ran into you? Because I've oh, heard the wall ran into me. Of course, yeah. you've been I knew there. That's the way it went down. <laughs> damn <laughs> walls! They've been jumping out of no damn where. Yep, yep. They keep telling me the third one is a rubber one, but it's never. <laughs> we used to actually say that about the you know the elbows that that in the city like Chicago that they hold the train up. They say they, you know the third one is always rubber, so you know take a shot. <laughs> take Ooh. a shot. So when you're in school, were you? Um... I know you were getting into a lot of trouble and it was a tough crowd. Um, but was there any kind of, um, you know, creative or theatrical things happening for you to get into involved with? Not at all. Woodshop <laughs> for like a half a Woodshop? I tried. No, you can learn a lot of stuff in Woodshop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Making bongs and other things. Losing digits. Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I got a B. <laughs> That's really funny. I'm I'm a carpenter by trade, so I totally get that. You can learn a lot on a job site too. No for shit. Sure. Yeah, I like to dabble in wood, but uh, it, better have some thick skin if you want to go into that that profession. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if you want to have thick skin, grow up where I grew up. So one other thing I wanted to mention, which was because you you brought up um, Stephen, you brought up the the arts. The, the arts was so far removed from my, you know, my field of vision at that time. Uh, I just wanted to stay out of jail. <laughs> That's so, smart. Uh, yeah, so I started uh, my first real acting job was a life and death one, which is I moved into an Irish neighborhood and I went to a like 95% black uh, middle school, all boys. And it was so, but I grew up in that neighborhood. So I was familiar. There was no culture shock. The culture shock was what was going on in the Irish neighborhood, which was really nothing. It was very sweet and very, and very middle class and all that. But I, I developed friends in the Irish neighborhood and I developed friends in the other, in the middle school. And those two people would never talk to each other. So it was never like, hey, let's all have a party. I'll bring some kids from middle school and some kids from the neighborhood. So I had to learn how to act one way in my home in the neighborhood and act an entirely different way just for the sake of, you know, keep myself alive in the other neighborhood at school. And so that was my first real acting job because if, if I behaved in my middle school, the way I behaved in, in my neighborhood, I'd have been eaten alive. That is a fantastic answer. That was that was, that was going to be, you answered the question I hadn't even asked yet, which was, <laughs> do you think that your upbringing in such a rough time correlates? Because I know when I have to jump into characters, I always go back to that mental Rolodex in my head of situations and people and, and the people watching and throwing myself into situations that I've either been through or been witness to. And I think you kind of answered it for me that you definitely derive a lot of your abilities probably from your whole life and how to handle situations from that part of your life. I mean, if you yeah. care to expand on it, man, the differences between them, because I think that helps out a lot, being able to reach in that quick. And then you have to be like improv. People talk about improv all the time. Shit, life is improv. And how many times did you find yourself in, you know, let's just say in a sling to where it was, man, if you'd have made the wrong decision, that's your ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I have been in, in many situations where if I didn't think fast enough on my feet, I wouldn't be on my feet. You know, it was literally, there's a, there was a lot of bad stuff out there. You know, I, when I was, when I was 11, I was smoking a pack a day. Wow. When I was 12, I started dabbling in heroin. Mm. And I didn't even know what cocaine was until I was like 17 or 18 because it really wasn't on the scene. Heroin was big. And so I was snorting it and all that kind of stuff. But that, that was it. I'll tell you one story about the snorting heroin thing. So me and my best friend 
were into doing this stuff. And uh, my best friend had other friends that I didn't know about that I didn't want to know about. Mm -hmm. So he calls me up one day and he says, hey, Nestor, let's go over to Joe Blow's house because he's going to have some friends there and they're going to do some stuff with needles. And it's called, uh, what is it called? Uh, pop, pop, skin popping as opposed to mainline. So I said, all right. I said, I'm going to go, but I'm not putting any needles into my body, period. But I'm going to go just for the experience. And we get over there into these people's houses in the, in the neighborhood I didn't really know, uh, people I didn't know. And there's these two guys that were like hardcore, hardcore junkies. And they were jacked up, getting ready to get their, their game on. And I was standing there watching and I was told I would be next. And so my sleeve was rolled up and I'm standing there and I'm watching these guys and the guy couldn't get the syringe to operate properly. And so it was jamming and he's trying to get it out. And the other guy's going, no, 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 let, let me. And he says, no, no, I got it. I got it. He finally gets it in there. The other guy sticks it in his arm and we're talking about mainline, right? He's got it in, in his vein and now he can't get that thing to operate again. So it won't go in and it won't come out. And the other guy's going, I can help you. And he's going, no, 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 I got that. And it was like this mad panic between the two of them because God forbid it should get lost. That's the big fear, right? That somehow it's going to get squirted away. And, mm, and, no. and yeah. So, and blood was squirting out of the, 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 where the needle was. And I looked at that and I said, Oh man, you don't want any part uh, of that. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, that was a great omen because, you know, where the situation, where the circumstance is slightly different, who knows? Wow. That's true. That's true. So, so th th those kinds of things to tie into to your question, those kinds of experiences, along with tons of great experiences that I had, uh, no, not tons, but pints of great experiences. Uh, that was, you know, that that's the kind of stuff that has rounded my experience. And sometimes you need to tap into something to, you know, to, to get a character or, and they've been really helpful to me. Absolutely. I don't have to imagine a whole lot. You know, it's 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 back there. That's right. I, I love that. I think it makes it more genuine when you play the part. I think, you know, there's a difference when you're watching something and you can tell that person is connected. You know, it's like when you see a comedian, they're so damn funny. It's like, you don't want to know the other side of that coin. Right. You don't want to know why that son of a bitch is so funny. You know, right. so it's right. just, it's... It's neat, and people need to understand that it's a sacrifice of self sometimes too to be able to do things too. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. I loved all that. That's that's. <laughs> we should do the more you know and the, all that banners up there. Uh, so what what drew you to acting? I mean, how did that how did that start? I mean, you came from a rough neighborhood, and how did what right. what, what was the catalyst of how that brought? Well. Yeah, I have a cousin of mine who who was he's ten years older than me, and he was at the at that time just getting into Hollywood. He had done a lot of theater, and uh, you know he was doing guest star roles on you know the the equivalent of Law and Order at the time, NYPD Blue, that kind of stuff. And uh, and I remember thinking, oh, I wasn't very close to him, and I remember thinking, oh, yeah, I have a cousin who's in show business. That's cool. Never thought. I would ever be involved in that. And so, but at the age of like 18, I became a computer operator in the Bank of New York in upstate. Got myself an apartment there, worked there for like a year, a little over a year. And I hated it. You know, you can literally hire monkeys to do that. Uh, it's, you push the same 12 buttons at every 15 minutes and you hope something goes wrong so that, got, you know, it breaks up your day. <laughs> and they had these card readers. Oh, it was just a. Anyway, I got bored with that, and I went back to. Uh, I went to college, Queens College, and uh, I was studying computer programming because I wanted to stay in the field. I, I, I thought I kind of thought it was going to be, you know, kind of in the future, and it would be cool. And but then 
I don't know. Nobody ever told me that there was math involved. So <laughs> I, I jumped out of that in a heartbeat. Math is for assholes. I mean, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm math. I made it to general math three, so I've got my own issues. All the now math the people. I can read a measuring tape, but I can't. No, no, no. See, all the mathematicians <laughs> just unsubscribed. How dare you? See? Right? Well, it's weird. Right. I mean, you don't have just to listen lost. to me any damn way. Half our audience is gone already. <laughs> Uh, so, so I went to, to school and, uh, I thought, okay, well, this is not working. But before I made the solid decision that this was not working, I started piddling around with other things. And so I wanted to meet girls. I really did. And I'm, I've always been shy. And so I thought, okay, so there are two good sources for female material. One was, uh, the camera club and I'm a bit of a shutter bug. So that kind of made sense. And the other one was a drama club. So I decided to audition for a show. Uh, does a tiger wear a necktie? And uh, I was just so taken aback by the whole experience. It was, you know, we, we rehearsed for three months. I, at first, the director gave me this tiny little role that had like one line in it. And then over the course of this really drawn out rehearsal process, a guy who had a really cool role dropped out and the director saw my enthusiasm and gave it to me. So it was, it was extraordinary. But after three months of rehearsals, the performances were for three days. And uh, I wasn't sure if I was making the right decision by saying, I think I want to be an actor. And so I quit my job in, in, in the bank and I moved back in with my mother and started studying at uh, Strasburg on 14th Street in, in Manhattan. And that was the beginning of my getting, you know, uh, uh, getting to understand other people that wanted to be artists. And, you know, you kind of like, there are some people that you just kind of follow and you go, that guy's cool and I like what he does and I'm going to stick with him. And, you know, so, so I learned a lot more by the people I hung out with while we were all in the early stages of wanting to be an actor than I did in the classes that I was taking to learn how to be an actor. So that was a, that was a really, really formative time. And I was living in the East Village. I left my mother's house. I moved into the East Village, which was, it made my early years in the Bronx look like I was, you know, in London at the, yeah. you know, the Windsor Castle or something. Let's go get some fresh baked bread and some chocolates. <laughs> Man, people were dying. They were dropping. They were getting robbed and mugged. And it was crazy, the East Village. Now, of course, you know, uh, coincidentally, I, I bought an apartment that I was, the apartment that I rented eventually became a, uh, a co-op. And I bought the apartment and I kept it for, I think, 20 years. I sold it 10 years ago. And... Uh, it's amazing what that neighborhood is today versus what it was. It's just gentrification. So I, 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 I only lived in that apartment for three years. I rented it for the remaining 17 years. Residual income. What's that? Residual income is good. Yes. Yes. Uh, so then uh, I decided that um, I was, I was committed to this and went to, live in the East Village, and I started working in, in improv theater, and there's a, a theater company, I think it's, it's, it's gone now, but it was called uh, Theater of the Streets? Uh, Street Theater. No. All right, I forget the name now, but it was Street Theater. That was the common name for that kind of theater. So you would hunker down and do improv in the theater, and uh, the two co-owners would write down all the material they thought was valuable. And uh, then they put it together and little by little over a couple of weeks, they condense it and maybe do some rewrites. And then we'd go out in the street and parade and do theater. And it was, it was great. That's awesome. I wouldn't do it again at gunpoint, <laughs> but it was great. At that. Please. No, like for real, you're being mugged. <laughs> <laughs> well, these are, you know, these are things that you needed to do to cut your teeth to, learn the craft and 
next thing and level up. And they were, and they were super worthwhile. It was, it was, uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff living in the East village and, and fearing for my life is not something that I would recommend, but, uh, those kinds of experiences, like we've talked about before, are the kinds of things that you put in your toolbox and you don't have to start going into some kind of meditation to find it, you know, it's there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Cause I, I heard you say mom twice and, and, and my brain automatically goes to comfort. And when it goes to comfort, as you might be able to tell, I am not a skinny person. Uh, if me and Steven stood next to each other, we'd make the number 10. Um, can you tell me what come like your comfort food and drink? Like what, what still brings you back to like a time, simple time, or just something that, you know, comfort food. Right. Right. Well, that, that, that's an easy one for me. It's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican and my mother oh. would make food. Yes. <laughs> yes. You can cut this off if you'd like. I understand. Nestor Serena. No kidding. You're not Italian. <laughs> he okay. looks like the Don in Sorry. the chair, though. So you know, hey. blonde hair, blue eyes, threw me off. So I, I, uh, I love your hair, I by got, the way. Uh, thank you. We all went to the same barber. We certainly Sweet. did. Magnifico. I forgot where it was. Where was it? Food, food, comfort food. Uh, my my mother used to make uh, something that we called arroz con gandules. And that's rice and like a chickpea, not quite, it's a slightly different, but it's in the chickpea family, along with um, uh, roast pork. And it's just, she would make that for Christmas because, you know, we didn't have any money. And so getting a big roast pork was very expensive. And, uh, so that was Christmas for us. And my Jewish wife learned from my Puerto Rican sister how to make it. And she has made it, if not as good as my mother's, more better. <laughs> more better. Yeah, more better. More better. That's like the opposite of saying bless your heart in the South. That's a very <laughs> yeah. good thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that, 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 for me, that's, and, and whenever there's a, a holiday um, uh, or somebody's birthday and, and our nuclear family, uh, that's what comes up. And my daughter, you know, who's going to be 10 any day now, she, uh, she also loves it. So it's, that's my food. You might want to get on the date exactly when she's turning 10. Cause I, I did that one time and I, 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 I still sleep in a separate bed. Didn't go well. <laughs> no, I know it is. It's November 15th. Bad so it's, a, it's Mine's the five. 17th. Uh, Woo! I don't mean that. Which one of you said that? You? Me. Oh, okay. I'm and my son, Scorpio. My son, my son is the 19th, ah. and I'm the 5th. We're all November and Novemberians. My, the fifth. my brother's is the 1st. My wife is the 26th. Of what month? October. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Now, I'm March 26th. Aries. Woo! Yeah, whatever. All right. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's the anniversary. That's our anniversary, March 26th. That's a good day. A lot of yeah. amazing people. We're born on the day that are super attractive. And, or else. And slim and lean and fit <laughs> like <laughs> And damn good looking too, boy. I mean, uh, so you play a lot of good and bad characters. Like which which out of those two, like which one do you really prefer? Do you like being getting into the grittiness of it or do you like being the hero? No, I like being a bad guy, for sure. You know, what happens in the industry, not so much anymore, because there are so many anti-heroes, like, you know, that started with The Sopranos and, and uh, uh, Breaking Bad and all those Dexter. Uh, but it, still, for the most part, it, and, and always in network TV, the good guys represent the network. And the network needs to make sure that they're well represented. So if you're a good guy in a network show, you got to watch the P's and Q's because you can get into trouble if you do all kinds of little things. And I've always found that to be very uh, anti-artistic. You know, when you start shutting people down because they're, they're trying some new things, and uh, I'll give you an example. I was doing a, an episode of JAG, 
I don't know if you remember that piece of shit. <laughs> so I'm doing an episode of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I came in and I was I was supposed to be the cap. It was during the time, you know, it was ripped from the headlines. So it was during the time that, that kid, the, the Cuban kid, got uh, picked up by a Navy, a U.S. Navy boat in, in off the shores of, of right. uh, Miami. And then Cuba was saying, no, no, that belongs to, he belongs to us. And right. there was a little we battle. Found him in the property. <laughs> so I was playing the captain of the Navy ship that discovered him. And then the tension was between the JAG officers and myself because I would not give the kid up. So I was, I was excited about it. You know, it was a great role. It was a, I didn't watch the show, so I didn't know how bad it was, <laughs> but I, I, it, was, it read really good. Okay. Well, and so I, uh, I get in there and I'm feeling it, man. I'm feeling it. I can't wait to start playing this character. So this, the way JAG works is JAG is given a lot of free stuff by the Navy because they do such a good job. And this is what I understood later. They do such a good job of representing the Navy the way the Navy wants them to. And so as a, res- a, a as a compensation for that, they get to go on like, you know, jet aircraft and shoot there. They get to go on boats and they get to go on Navy yards and all kinds of free stuff. And so as they they also have a guy there that they used to call Popeye, who was the technical advisor that would make sure that everything was done, you know, on the up and up. And so I get in there and I had a scene where I had to do something. And I took this little pause because I wanted to kind of put a button on the, on the, the, the next word. So I kind of paused a little bit and then gave it to him feeling really good. I thought, man, that, that went really well. And the director comes over to me and he goes, Nestor, you can't do that. I said, why? He goes, you, you can't. If you pause, it looks like you're insecure or unsure of yourself. And I said, that, what? No. So uh, 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 Navy people don't pause? What the fuck? Anyway, so that was the beginning of what turned out, what turned out to be the worst experience of my <laughs> career. <laughs> it was just downhill from there. Mm. And, you know, I've been reading at that point, I had been reading scripts for probably 20, 25 years. I know how a, a, a scene is structured. Dramatic and- pauses. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what i did what was wrong with that right you know what it was it's your sex appeal they couldn't handle that shit right yeah your you aerodynamic is a melting son of a the bitch. camera I was, I was too hot for them to like nesto said the smolder <laughs> blue, oh, blue steel blue <laughs> steel <laughs> so uh so i'm doing this scene and i'm feeling really down because i feel like I'm underappreciated, constantly being uh, picked on, I felt, you know, and I, I, I was just not feeling good. And then I get to the scene that I think, I know this scene. This is the scene that starts with a slight, you know, uh, uh, disagreement, and it turns into a fucking, like, crazy screaming out of the top of my lungs because it's my ship and I'm the goddamn captain. And so I do the scene, and I felt... I felt like I had been given a new lease on life, at least as far as that showed. And the director pulls me over and he goes, Nestor, he said, look, you were so into what you were doing there that uh, I didn't want to interrupt you, but if I let that go, the the producers would cut my balls off. And I said, why? He goes, you can't scream. I go, what do you mean you can't scream? He says, you can't, captains don't scream. They're in control. Captain they don't lose their patience. Screen. They don't lose this. They don't lose that. Everyone, yeah. get off. Everyone get off quickly. <laughs> We're going down, guys. <laughs> <laughs> We're no, sinking. Sense. no sense. I just wanted to let you know. We're guys. sinking We're like sinking. this director's career. Right. Uh, 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 what's that? Like the world's worst piece of advice? When your wife is angry at you, just tell her to calm down. She will instantly realize that she's overreacting and calm down. Right, right. Oh, shit. So that was absurd. And that 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 was one of those experiences that was just a, a nightmare. An absolute nightmare. Oh, man. Did you have um, people that um, inspired you to want to act, or was it just for the women? And how did the women getting go? Did that go well for you? <laughs> Inquiring minds want to uh, know. 
it was it was mostly for the women, but um, uh, I did I did once I started getting into it, I started looking for inspiration, and uh, the the top guy at at that moment, like for a couple of maybe a year or so was Robert De Niro. I knew you were going to say that. And Holy that, crap. I'm thinking he's going to say Robert De Niro. Which one's the next one? Because the next one, he's a little young. Al Pacino. Oh, Man. Okay. Ferrell. Al Pacino. Not, not Will Ferrell. Okay. <laughs> not Will Ferrell. Al Pacino. <laughs> no, he was just a baby. <laughs> you got too? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But Al Pacino, I saw Panic in Needle Park. I don't know if anybody has seen that, but I would highly recommend it. Not the best movie, but he was 19 years old. And he just knocked it out of the Needle Park. Needle Park. Yeah, he was he was awesome. And you could see one of the, the I think the, the main reason for watching it is to see how you can see the magic even at 19. He had just graduated from the School of Performing Arts. So that was uh, th th that was my inspiration, and then of course you know I, I, Robert Duvall. I think is probably one of the greatest American actors. Period, uh, except for maybe Meryl Streep. So I've got my usual suspects. Awesome, Ooh, that's another good movie. <laughs> <laughs> and how many? It's called Wordplay, <laughs> Kicking Ass. And how many of those people that you mentioned have you worked with and or met? I, I got to work with uh, Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. Uh, I never, I don't oh, think I even ever oh, met Al Pacino. Oh, but you know, when I when I worked with, Al, with Robert De Niro, it was when he was at the top of his game. Oh, so wow. he had just finished doing Raging Bull. I worked with him in 86, so Raging Bull was 80. And then... Uh, Got the he untouchables, really all kinds of But things. he was in, in the process of shooting Angel. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think he also, he was doing Angel, Angel something, Angel hair, Angel face, Angel <laughs> with uh, Mickey Rourke. Oh, yeah. And uh, we ended up doing a play on Broadway. And that was pretty cool. Do you play any music? <laughs> Do, I... Do you play I'm musical instruments? Here. Oh, oh, I thought you were doing something out of a character. From no, a I don't know what he's doing. Talking. He was just going, I don't know. Here's the thing, Nestor. Uh, no one ever knows what the hell I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> not even me. T-Rexing, I'm not sure. <laughs> See a real filter. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I don't play. Uh, in fact, I really... Neither do I. Uh, I, was, I was just talking to my son, literally about 10 minutes before you, we got on. And I was telling him, we have a piano. When we bought this house 10 months ago, uh, one of the things that attracted us to the house was that they have this big sunroom with a, a white baby grand piano. So that's not why we bought the house, but that's what made us go, oh, shit, let's get this house a little closer. I, I believe we've made it. Why? There's a white grand piano in the foyer. It's not a foyer anymore. It's a giant room, smart house. Well, we call it the piano room now. But it's... Uh, it, 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 it's been on the back of my mind, and I want my daughter, uh, soon to be ten year old daughter, to learn how to play the piano. And uh, I'd like to learn too. I'm, I just don't have a, a a natural knack for it. Well, you got two musicians right here, and I will tell you, as me having some children that are that sing and play music, it is a absolute wonderful feeling to watch or hear someone you created create something else you know what i mean <laughs> that's not just drama and like can i have something more to eat i give yeah, you no, that you leave me alone and 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 her window is is closing because my 32 year old son uh i i took him to piano lessons for like three years when he was about six years old and uh, he never went back to it and you know he couldn't play chopsticks if you know, his life depended on it but I, on the other hand, I think uh, I want to start by being a, a role model. So I want to get into it <laughs> with my daughter. Nice. And, you know, hopefully. Yeah, have a little bit of daddy, up. daddy, uh, daughter competition. Like, look daddy at me. What? Uh, look what I do. Look what I can do. Oh, look yeah. what I can do. <laughs> you like the dueling piano? It'll be epic. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. But I, I, I tried dabbling with a harmonica years ago. And because, you know, when you travel, you're in a hotel room 
I was thinking, okay, so you're in a hotel room, you can't make a lot of noise, and uh, it's I don't like carrying a lot of luggage, so harmonica made sense. And I, I did it for a while. I can play, uh, what's the song I can play? Oh, I forget. Oh, but there's a song I play it. Blues Traveler? Well, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke on the water. Uh, <laughs> a song everybody learns. Uh, it's it's the one that goes uh, something about the the, the 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 grass is high and the summer is long. You know, it's an old country uh, south southern. And mm-hmm. the and the da 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 da. Do you know the song? Oh, the na, na, na. That's Bob say, Dylan. That's Bob Dylan. No, I don't know who the hell it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not. No. The, uh, summertime and the living is easy. That's the one. The yeah, art of music in your voice right there, Nestor, with that sweet I velvet. Know. Look at you. Look at that. Uh, the velvety pipes. I can bring it when I need it. Ah, Ooh, see? Hey, and that's another question. And that's a question for you is, have you done any voiceover before? I have done voiceover. Yeah, yeah. I've done I've done a, you know, a handful here, a handful there. But uh, I think my claim to fame in the voiceover world is I I was the um, I was the vo- I was the voice of Harley Davidson for uh, about 2 years, two and a half years. Oh, nice. Thanks. Sold some that motor cool. cycles. I like that. Yeah. Sweet. Feel the fire between your legs. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a Harley story. So I'm the I'm the voice of Harley, right? And I'm doing and when you do these things, I'm sure you guys know you're doing you could do four, five, six sessions in in one session. And so I'm I'm doing one. And it was something the the lines went something like you can buy a brand new Harley Davidson for $6,500. And so and I don't ride, right? But I said, oh, wow. I said, you can buy a Harley for $6,500? He goes, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like a, you know, it's an entry level, but it's, it's, it's a nice bike. I said, so as the voice of Harley, what kind of discount would I get if I wanted to buy a bike? Because I've always kind of wanted to buy a bike. The guy goes, let me talk to my execs and then the next time we come in i'll have a number for you i said okay come back a couple of weeks later and i go by the way what's what was up with the uh, the my motorcycle he goes well uh we are willing to offer you a 10 percent discount i was like what well, look I, said, like I can walk in off the street and say uh you know give, give, give me a bike and give me 15 percent off they'll give it to me right so you were like the voice of Harley. The, the voice of Harley <laughs> was riding a Triumph. Ah, see? So I bought a Triumph. Ew. Hey, man, they didn't want to play. That'll teach him. Right? Oh, business. Don't be a dick. <laughs> that's been a repeating, yeah, that was shitty. That's that's been was a repeating thing on the show. It happens Don't more than you would dick. think. Just then be like, oh, thank you for your services. Go to hell. I appreciate that. Yeah. Pretty much. Mm-hmm. We don't care whether or not you care. You're not getting well, the on. truth is I can't I can't really complain very much. I've been very lucky, you know, and I've had a lot of uh, people. It's a, it's amazing how many, you know, there there's a, there's an entire cottage industry in Los Angeles where their main job is to give shit away. And so they're called gifting suites. Hmm. And you go to a gifting suite that's being sponsored by Mattel. And you walk out of there with like, you know, a truckload of whatever it is, Barbies, Ken's, this, that. Where do we so sign? Trucks. Hmm? I said, where do we sign? And then, you know, but that goes across the board. And something we haven't talked about yet, by the way, which is my, I have a handicapped daughter. Uh, she's 15 and she's um, severely handicapped. She has cerebral palsy. And so she's non-ambulatory and, and she can't speak. Um, and uh, we don't know where she is cognitively. But uh, so it, we would go to a lot of gifting suites for handicapped kids. And that came in really handy. But uh, the other ones are just, you know, giving away shit that I didn't even know I wanted until I got. <laughs> you know, I got an entire 
an entire collection of uh, like uh, yard machinery. I got a lawn mower. I got a snow blower. I got uh, leaf blowers. I got uh, branch cutters and and all kinds of chainsaws and all that stuff. The batteries. And... So anyway, I'm not complaining about the few times that I got fucked by right. You know, now, people greedier it, than me. Now is that new having a house, or are you living like in like in the city and you just moved to? Baltimore to kind of spread out or were you in a house before? No, we were living in California and we had a house out there. Oh, okay. And, and yeah, we, uh, we lived out there for 10 years after my mom passed away. My son went back to school in Japan. I decided what, why am I staying here? 500 square foot apartment, you know, and a handicapped daughter. We had an elevator that sometimes worked and sometimes didn't. That's and uh, so we decided let's let's move to California and it increased my my income and uh, it lowered my um, my uh, costs. So I was paying less for stuff and uh, making more money. So isn't that funny? You're move. paying less in California for stuff. I'm like that doesn't sound right. Yeah. It's, you know, unless unless you live in California or New York, uh, it's hard to comprehend that. But yeah, it is. It is because you see the prices. Always like the look on California, California, Californian people. Damn it! <laughs> and then New York, yeah. when they come down to Georgia, they're like, "Holy shit! You can have all this for two dollars and fifty cents." Holy! <laughs> you guys, each have your own bedroom. Holy! <laughs> you're poor. You're 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 poor here. I'm mean, like, yeah, dude. It's called a we duplex. Got, we got three this bathrooms. Is a fucking condo. Yeah. yeah. You you guys have your own yard. Yeah, you can grow food if you want. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. It's uh, it, it it's it, to give you an idea. My water bill in California was uh, roughly five hundred to six hundred dollars a month, just Jesus. for the water. Just Wash for water. Yaks or some shit. And it wasn't the best water in the world either. It, you know, it, it's getting... <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> but it's scarce. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I still talk to people in California. I, I talk to a lot of people in California and people are panicking. They're going to start restricting water usage. Yeah. People and, are, people uh, are, ma are mass exiting from uh, California big time. I mean, I know you just did 10 months ago and I hear in Baltimore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a lot. I came out here because I came out here because mostly because of my handicapped daughter and my wife and the relationship she has with my wife grew up here. So my mother-in-law lives five minutes down this street and my sister-in-law lives five minutes up that street. And the entire half of this village uh, is uh, knows my wife. So, you know, <laughs> so she had to be back. She's like the town, you know, princess. She's got to be there for everybody. Well, the, the way it went down was I, I was... When Ga when Gavin Newsom shut down L.A. for the second time, uh, there was no work to be had after the first time. And I was hoping things were going to start picking up. And when he shut it down the second time, I looked at my wife and I go, why are we paying such a high premium to live near studios that aren't hiring me? I said, let's go to let's go to Santa Barbara. Let's go to uh, Ojai. Let's go to. And there's all these beautiful places in Southern California that aren't Los Angeles. And she said, look, Nestor. You are 65 years old, and uh, you want to uproot your family to a place that we don't know anyone at and start all over again. And if something were to happen to you, it would be beholden on me to take care of our daughters. Smart lady. So I said, I can't argue with that. So we came to Baltimore. And there you are. And, and quite frankly. It wouldn't have helped. She'd have got her way. <laughs> yeah, no matter how it was, it was going to go that way. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. But you know, when we when we first got married, uh, or were engaged, about to be married, and even after we were married, everybody because we got married here at, at the uh, the Marriott in Baltimore, and everybody would say to us, "Why don't you come and live in Baltimore? Come on, come and live in Baltimore." And I would respond like this: If I was ever to live in Baltimore, I'd have to buy a house with a big oak tree so that I can hang myself. 
<laughs> now we have a weeping willow in the front yard. <laughs> oh, but like so that was a, that was a big commitment on my part to to not to not to stroke my own ego, but I'll do it. The, the, <laughs> the entire family had no idea when when Debbie called her mother and said, "It looks like we're moving to Baltimore." She just broke down and cried. You know, they're in their eighties. They can't. It's hard for them to fly out to Balt, uh, to California. Yeah. We couldn't fly out with our daughter. It's just a nightmare. So you know, they come out once a year and hang out for a couple of weeks. And so now they're in and around all the time. Uh, my daughter likes to go and hang out with uh, with them on the weekends and spend the night and go apple picking and all that. All that's going teaching. <laughs> all those things you can do. Well, it sounds like, um, you know, even from your upbringing being so tough and um, difficult, it seemed like you turned out to be a sweetheart of a man. Well, thank you. Good man. Sometimes. Well, you know, you can't, well, you can't you lose really it. Ask, right? You got to keep the edge, man. That's just that's Dude, the you way don't... it is. Yeah, well, my, my wife might want to talk you out of that one. What's that uh, one? <laughs> You can I got you can be truly peaceful unless you're willing to do great violence. The great what? You can't truly be peaceful unless you're willing to do great violence. I mean, that's a little deep, but there's a lot of depth in there that tells you, hey, you're going to have to fight for what you want. And obviously, you fought your whole life and you got a kick ass chair and a nice family and you're sitting <laughs> in Baltimore with a baby grand piano. So, you know. Well, I got I to gotta bring this chair back to my uh, neighbor. They lent it to me for this uh, interview. <laughs> That's a nice neighbor. He's like, I have to look like like the Don. Man, I've had such a good time. If you could give anybody, I mean, like real advice, don't tell them to go join a street gang, you're going to be a ruffian or nothing. But if you could really give them advice, something that's helped you through all your time, just maybe like, you know, a motto, a memory, just something that kept you hanging on, you know, because everybody has shitty times. But like, what's one piece of advice you'd give to somebody that's just, stagnant in the entertainment industry at this moment uh, you know i there are a few things in my life that i am more proud of than being a father and i i was a with a different woman uh my 32 year old son uh i was 32 when he was born and i i kept him she, his mother's japanese so she, she had to go back to Japan for six months. It's that whole, like, you can't come back until you go, and then you come back. So for six months, it was just me and him in my tiny little uh, East Village apartment. And uh, I realized that, uh, that the greatest thing that I could do is to try to raise healthy, uh, critical thinkers that really are prepared as much as you can prepare them for when they get older. I want to have, I want that to be my legacy. And I do that with my other two daughters as well. And so when I, when I think of, when I get myself into trouble, which is often, (laughs) uh, I, I try to, I try to keep myself below the radar so that I don't get into too much trouble that I can't provide for my family. And that has really kept me uh, on the up and up. And it's, it's level, it's, 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 uh, it's kept my feet on the ground. And, uh, and it's one of the most joyous experiences of my life is being a father and a husband. But that, that's, that's been the one thing. Other than that, I've been, you know, I was a, I was a nomad, you know, I'd be traveling around, go stay in some people's houses, getting into trouble with that girl and this girl and <laughs> just all kinds of, but whenever I got into real trouble, you know, like I, man, I really regret I did that. I think about, you know, uh, what I want to be for my kids and, uh, and, uh, try to be a good role model. Does that answer your question? It does. It, it, it does. A lot of people don't say, oh, I want to be selfless and leave good stuff behind. They usually say something completely different. I love that answer. <laughs> it's a real answer. 
And who like who wakes up and says, "Man, I hope my kid's a piece of shit." When <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, like leaving a part of yourself and instilling yourself in your children is a huge part of being a parent. And some people, as you and I and everybody knows, are really shitty at their job. <laughs> So no man, that's a perfect answer. I appreciate that. Yeah, my dad was a uh, was a real, a real piece of work, and he wasn't around often. But when he did, we wish he were around. Uh, and uh, growing up, are you my brother? <laughs> <laughs> Separated at birth. And growing up, I, I, I and and becoming a father, I would look at my. I had no experience, you know. I no, I didn't have anybody to show me what what it's like to be a man. Uh, or to be a father or a provider or a husband. And so I, I just kind of had to wing it and use common sense. And oftentimes I literally, I, I, it might sound like an old joke, but uh, I would look at the circumstance that just occurred with my son and I would say, what would my father do? And I would do the opposite. Wow. And it would work like a charm. Amen to that. Hey, I don't know what made me think of this, but I'm going to throw this you ready please i was in vegas doing a movie about four years ago and i ended up hanging out the executive producer was very close to buddy rich anybody here know who buddy rich is uh -huh. okay yeah no 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 maybe no not, not buddy rich is a drummer who's the impersonator who is a comic who is really big in like the 70s? rich little rich little so the executive producer is a good friend of rich little so we're sitting at the table, Rich Little sitting next to me, and he tells me a joke, ready? It goes something like this. These two guys are at a bar, and one guy turns to the other guy and he says, when I get home, I'm gonna rip my wife's panties off. And the other guy goes, man, you must be horny. He goes, no, the elastic is killing me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like that joke, there's, there's, a, there's two old men sitting on a country store and there's a dog, and the dog is just having the time of his life licking on himself. And then one old man looks at the other one and goes, man, I wish I could do that. And the other man goes, ooh, he'd bite you. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's Mister, rich. You got one there, Rich? No, I don't. I, my, I'm just trying to keep things on track. He even only collects guitars. Yeah, I can, and headphones. Real back there, Nestor. Oh, you collect guitars? I didn't Look notice. Back yeah. There. Um, it's pretty subtle. Oh, I show him the uh, guitar that is for his episode. It's amazing, actually. We have a different guitar sitting. That's how many guitars Stephen has. It's a different one. I can for feature every one for every episode. So that's your wow. guitar. That's a nylon mm -hmm. string uh, silent guitar. So that one's pretty cool. Oh, good. I could play the silent guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Don't plug it in. It's perfect. That's awesome, Master. Where can everyone find you if they wanted to find you? Or if you want to be well, found. you know, I, I, found. I have to say that, yeah, right now I, I really don't want to be found. So <laughs> I, I, and I'll leave this on a kind of a somber note, but I was having a really hard time uh, the last maybe seven, eight years. I was just finding myself, you know, when I got into this business, I wanted to be, I was, I was so ambitious and so excited. And, uh, and then once I started getting work, in theater, that was like amazing. And uh, then I started doing TV and I, I knew, you know, I was an extra and then I was a day player and then I was a regular and you're doing shit that's, you know, all of a sudden I, I own an apartment that I got to pay a mortgage on. And so I would do work that I wasn't really all that excited about, but I would do it because I had to put, you know, I got to pay the mortgage. And then, so it just got worse and worse and worse. I started having more of those JAG episodes. <laughs> where people just, you know, just were not fun to work with. Uh, it wasn't creative. It wasn't fun. It wasn't exciting. And the last seven or eight years, I, I, I said to myself, you know, why am I putting myself through this? Why, I no longer need, I, I, I don't need to work. So why don't I just wait until something good comes along and, uh, and, and then I'll do that. In the meantime, I could hang out here with my family. So that's what I, I took two years off where I didn't do anything. And then uh, I came back and I, uh, I did an episode of uh, Law and Order, uh, the new one with uh, uh, Christopher Maloney, uh, Organized Crime. And, uh, 
and that was fun I've, because I've done so many of them and I, I like everybody there and it's a good cast and, and Chris is great. But I've, I've been turning down more stuff than, uh, than I'm taking because it's just not, it's not worth it for me anymore. Well, you didn't turn us down and I appreciate that <laughs> very much. I, well, I didn't have to leave that. That's right? true. We made it easy for you at least. It was yeah. the best. Well, I guess well, that's the part of the show that I actually have to wrap it up now. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody for time. coming. It's been another episode of VO and Stereo. Um, come back again. I hope you enjoyed this episode because I did because it was freaking awesome. So much. I fun. had a good time. It's such a, so much See? fun. I still had a good time. If you didn't have a good time, well then, I'm just kidding. We'll see all you. Right, guys. Thank you so much. Yay. Thank you all very much. And thanks for inviting me, guys. Appreciate Absolutely. it.